What's good, self-direct investors, and welcome back to another episode of Reality Check Cannabis in 2020. My name is Jordan. I want to thank you so much for returning to my channel. If you've missed episode one or two, I recommend you check them out to get up to speed. That being said, if you have subscribed to the channel already, thank you so much for doing so. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do so to make sure that you don't miss a new episode dropping every Sunday. And I really appreciate the love and support. And lastly, before we jump in, if you enjoy this video, please hit that thumbs up button and show some love. Thank you kindly, and without further ado, let's dive into episode three, the top US companies to watch. We're gonna look at something called the compounded annual growth rate, which is the average annual growth rate of an investment over a specific period of time longer than one year. For the next decade, alcohol is expected to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of just 3.1%, which is quite small. And if we look at tobacco, their outlook for the next decade as well is 3.1%. So this means if you were to invest in the alcohol or tobacco industry today, you can expect your money to grow at a rate of 3.1% each year going forward. That's not a lot of growth. However, we know that these are mature industries. So it has to be remembered that these mature industries had to start as new industries at some point, likely facing a lot of stigma and doubt as well. But guess what happened to these companies over time? They supply the demand. So what are the compounded annual growth rate estimates for the cannabis market? This means an investment in a solid, well-chosen company within the cannabis industry could expect to see 33% growth each year because this is still an industry in its seedling phase. Now, before we start this episode, because we will be diving into potential companies, I have to remind you that none of what I say should be taken as direct investment advice. I'm simply sharing my opinion, what I know to be true, and what I think will happen. In the short term, no one knows what will happen to any share prices. And many companies have been on bull runs and are up over 100% since March lows. And they are now seeing some pullbacks as shown by this six month chart here. Most don't know, and I didn't even realize until writing this episode, was that the industry has been chugging along in the US since 2015. The US Marijuana Index is a benchmark much like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ used to, used to track the performance of the 31 best cannabis companies in the United States. The industry is very volatile as you can see, hitting new all-time highs and lows almost annually. That being said, I caution you not to go make any investments based off of this information right now. Instead, I encourage anyone who sees the massive potential in the future of this industry to start educating themselves on it today and just begin paying attention. This means adding a few companies that you like to your watch list so that you can track the share price change and the market cap change over time so that you can plan your right entry point. You should only buy shares in a company when all of your research, due diligence, and sound judgment scream yes. To quote Benjamin Graham, the author of The Intelligent Investor, Warren Buffett's mentor, and the father of value investing, you're neither wrong nor right because the crowd disagrees with you. You are right because your data and reasoning are right. And although I personally believe that this industry will be massive and I'm very bullish, I also have a job in time, so I'm prepared to wait. The thing is, US legalization might not take place anytime soon, and I could be wrong for another period of years, and that's okay. I don't think I will be, but it's possible. There are so many factors that need to align for decriminalization to happen, while big industry also stands in the way. For example, if Trump wins in November and the Republicans keep control of the Senate, that's practically a wet dream for them, while the cannabis industry may be forced to operate in cash and deal with, another, deal with the double standard for another two to four years. Now this would likely threaten the well-being of most people, not cannabis related, just if, if Trump were to win again, plus business owners and employees in the cannabis industry for what, four more years of uncertainty and quotable remarks? I don't think we need any more of that. Secondly, if Trump wins, but the Democrats were to win a Senate majority, that would likely lead to an angry Trump. However, decriminalization could still happen within a few years thanks to the power of Congress. While a Democratic victory this fall would lead to a sad Trump and the most bullish scenario for investors, and set decriminalization and nationwide medical legalization for early 2021, leaving recreational legalization up to individual states. We can't predict the future, but we can use the information at our disposal right now to figure out possible outcomes and try to act accordingly. And so these are all the US multi-state operators that make up the US Marijuana Index, but I'll only cover the five US companies that I'm personally keeping an eye on in this video. I will cover the top Canadian companies in the next episode, but Canadians, save your FOMO, we can only grow as fast as Ontario and Quebec open stores, so there's no rush. The US is where the population is and growth will come much faster. And before we jump in, I just need to explain the concept of market capitalization for any beginners or new investors watching. So focus your attention on the right side here with the arrows. Most people pay attention and fixate on the stock price and often a high stock price will scare them away. 
These are people you should never take investment advice from because the stock price is not what's important. The market capitalization is. So as of September 4th, Curaleaf has the largest market cap at 3.8 billion US dollars. Green Thumb Industries has the second largest at 2.7 billion US dollars. Trueleaf has a market cap of 2.1 billion. Cresco Labs has a market cap of 1.1 billion. And Harvest Health and Recreation had the lowest market cap at 440 million. Market cap is what you get when you multiply the share price by the total number of outstanding shares available to buy. And market capitalization represents the total perceived value of a company at a given time based on what the market believes. Market cap is the real number that you need to pay attention to, and it fluctuates daily with the stock price as buyers and sellers trade ownership. So remember the market cap is the number to keep an eye on because it determines the total value of a company at any given time. You want to pay attention because remember price and value are two different things. For example, in the image, Trueleaf currently sits at a market cap of $2.1 billion, which puts the price of a single share at $19.32. But in March 2020, when shit hit the fan and people weren't paying attention to this industry, the share price fell to $6, which effectively brought their market cap down to under $700 million because six goes into $19.32, three times and some, just like $700 million would go into $2.1 billion roughly three times. Similarly, if Curaleaf's market cap fell by half to $1.9 billion, the share price would fall to $3.57. And if all signs point to growth, that would be a great time to buy the stock when it's oversold or simply undervalued. The whole idea of successful investing is to find companies that are trading at a low market cap or valuation relative to their true value, as this gives you a margin of safety that the price will not go down much more, but has a lot more room to go back up. This is what made Warren Buffett the second wealthiest man alive. Now we will briefly touch on these companies' income statements, balance sheets, and cash balances, and I'm still learning to interpret these as I go, but I want to just give a huge shout out to these two Canadian YouTubers that really helped my knowledge and understanding of financial statements, Daniel Pronk and Griffin Milks. Their videos have helped reinforce a lot of what I've read and learned, so go subscribe and check them out. Griffin also has a great in-depth financial breakdown of the US multi-state operators and Canadian licensed producers that you can cross-reference with the information that you'll see here. But without further ado, here's a quick run through of the five companies that I'm watching and what their plans are. The first company is Curaleaf, but something worth knowing, since cannabis is still federally illegal, none of these companies can list on well-known US exchanges, so US investors have to invest through the over-the-counter markets. Curaleaf's OTC ticker symbol is CURLF, and it's currently trading at a market cap of 3.8 billion US dollars. And obviously all companies face this problem, so they also list on the Canadian Securities Exchange. And on the CSC, uh, Curaleaf's ticker is CURA.CN, and this gives Canadian investors exposure. Yay! And that market cap sits at $4.9 billion in Canadian dollars. Now what puts Curaleaf apart is that they have the largest footprint of all US multi-state operators, with dispensaries for recreational or medicinal purposes located in Oregon, Nevada, Arizona, North Dakota, Florida, Maine, Vermont, New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Massachusetts, and soon to be Utah. To find up-to-date information about any company, you simply need to visit their website and all the information is laid out to you on a silver platter. So within these states, they are operating through 90 local dispensaries, they have multiple cultivation and processing sites, and over 350,000 registered patients. Something to keep in mind, happy medical patients usually become return customers. And besides growing and selling, they're educating and giving back to their community, so what's not to like? Every publicly traded company has an investor relations page. It can be found in the footer of every website if you scroll down to the bottom and find for investors or investor relations. Here they put all the information in one place for you, reinforcing the competitive advantage. It doesn't get better than that. Imagine trying to learn to invest in 1928 compared to now, you'd get crushed. And some second quarter highlights. They brought in $124 million in managed revenue, up 16% from three months ago and 120% year over year, despite the global situation costing them $25 million. They also generated cash flow from operations of 23.4 million while completing a number of acquisitions, which solidified their position as the world's largest cannabis company at this time. Retail revenue refers to cannabis sold through dispensaries, while wholesale revenue refers to bulk sales both way ahead of 2019 numbers. If you take the combined revenue and subtract the costs of goods sold, 
which is all the costs it takes to make and sell to customers, they earned $42.7 million in gross profit. They're also sitting on a healthy $122 million cash balance and have total assets of $1.3 billion. As with personal finance, you always want to have more income coming in than you are spending. Otherwise, your debt will outweigh what you own, and that's not sustainable over time. If we take a look at their total liabilities, they're sitting at $654 million. Now, you always want the liabilities to be less than the company's total assets. Also, in financial statements, they are always uh, displayed in millions, so their total liabilities are $650 million, not $654,917. And when you subtract the total liabilities from the total assets, you get the shareholder equity, also known as book value, of $677,661, which represents the fair value of the company at this time without future growth baked into the current price. The next company is Green Thumb Industries, which trades on the over-the-counter markets with the ticker symbol GTBIF and on the Canadian Securities Exchange under the ticker GTII.CN. Green Thumb is a heavy hitter in Illinois focused on the leading consumer packaged goods sector and their website feels like a day out in nature. They have six high performing brands, 13 manufacturing facilities, licenses for 96 retail locations operating in 12 US markets, and they employ over 1,800 staff serving thousands of patients and customers. That is what you want to hear. Since the US is so big with so much untapped opportunity due to its current laws, the moment states open up, the companies with the most cash will pounce to increase their footprint. All they're doing now is establishing effective systems, so it's just a matter of choosing a few winners, making your move, and patiently waiting for the laws to change. Green Thumb's Q2 earnings hit $119 million, up 16% from three months ago, and a 167% increase year over year compared to 44 million at the same time last year. That is wild growth. And gross margin, which is the net sales revenue minus cost of goods sold, is up to 53%. Now, a good thing to remember is that the higher the gross margin, the more money a company keeps on each dollar of sales. Now, despite the great revenue increases, they did suffer a net loss of $12 million, which means all in they spent a little bit more than 119.6 million to bring in 119.6 million. We'll start from the top. So if you subtract the cost of goods sold by the total revenue, you end up with a gross profit of $63 million. Then below that though, you must subtract more expenses required for business, like general and administrative costs, which include marketing, staff salary, and other admin costs. So they ended up with $14 million after subtracting SG&A, which stands for sales, goods, and administrative, I believe. However, a few extra expenses did push them $10 million into the negative. So, a good thing to keep in mind with financial statements, when a number is in brackets, that does mean it is a negative number. One thing I did notice is that despite sitting on $82 million in cash, plus other current assets of $69 million, and current assets are things that they own right now that they could sell for liquid cash and use within the next 12 months, combined, they're sitting at current assets of $152 million. While their current liabilities, which is the money that they owe to someone within the next 12 months, is sitting at $122 million. Now this isn't bad since their current assets cover their current liabilities, however, the gap is a little bit close for my liking. This week in cannabis, there are a few big developments to take a look at. With the election coming up on November 3rd, not only are Americans voting for a new leader, but many are voting for new state laws around cannabis. Four states are voting on recreational adult use, Arizona, Montana, New Jersey, and South Dakota, while three are voting on medical cannabis, Mississippi, Nebraska, and South Dakota. I also just want to point out that Oregon is voting to legalize medicinal use of psilocybin at the bottom. Good job, Oregon. Nature for the win. Now, obviously, this year has been unprecedented with the global outbreak, outbreak, so priorities have had to shift. Nonetheless, many more states do plan to vote on legal recreational come 2021, which include Arkansas, Florida, Ohio, North Dakota, Missouri, and Oklahoma, most aiming for November of that year. What does this mean for new investors? There's still plenty of time to start paying attention before the growth really takes off, depending what happens in November. Next up, New Zealand's cannabis legalization and control bill is up for vote in their election next month, which could make New Zealand the third country in the world to regulate non-medical cannabis production, sales, and consumption. How do their regulations differ from Canada's? You'll be able to home grow, two plants a person, maximum four plants, personal possession and social sharing is half that of Canada's at 14 grams, or half an ounce per person, while the minimum age for consumption is 20 years old. 
Public consumption will not be allowed, while pub lounges will be, but you can't order cannabis through the mail, as producers will be limited and marketing will also be restricted. Great news on New Zealand for taking initiative, but don't expect it to be a moneymaker for investors, as the main requirement is population size, and in that category, New Zealand falls a bit short at just 4.8 million people. And lastly, Aurora Cannabis, one of the well-known big three in Canada, has provided some scary updates, so if you hold heavy Aurora bags, keep working those arms. They appointed a new CEO, the third this year after Terry Booth and Michael Singer. Now, they expect quarter four net revenue of around $70 million, However, the big red flag is their plan to record up to $1.8 billion in goodwill impairment charges in Q4, which means they spent a lot of money in the past to buy companies in different parts of the world they thought would increase their revenues. However, they did not, so now they have to write off that wasted money as a loss. Considering they will write off $1.8 billion and they only have a current market cap, meaning their worth right now is $1.1 billion, they bit off a bit more than they could chew. Now, this is a reflection of the hype that took the industry and new investors by storm in 2018, a lesson for those investors still paying attention, which I will cover more in episode four. And back at it, True Leaf Cannabis Corp trades on the over-the-counter markets with the ticker symbol TCNNF and on the Canadian Securities Exchange under the ticker TURL.CN. I went to True Leaf's site and this was the first thing I noticed. True Leaf's marketing and product placement is on point, as is their illness protection awareness, as they connect patients with doctors better than the US government and require masks for obvious health and safety reasons. And they can do all this while offering great value deals on top of that. No wonder True Leaf has been crushing it in Florida. True Leaf's mission is to focus on the customer experience because as I highlighted before, happy medical patients often become return customers. They have 52 dispensaries in Florida now and a patient count of over 344,000 in climbing. The more locations True Leaf can open, the more patients they can serve and the more efficient their systems become, the more money they will make for investors. True Leaf's second quarter included revenue of 120.8 million, up 26% from three months prior, and they brought in a free cash flow of 39.6 million, increasing their cash stockpile to $150 million. One thing that stands out for all of these companies is, is, is the significant year-over-year -year growth, and Truly is another great example. And although operating expenses are increasing, they are doing so at a very slow rate compared to the revenue growth they are also seeing, which is great, because you do want the two numbers working against each other. And if we look at their balance sheet, True Leaf's total current assets, which again is everything True Leaf owns that they could sell in exchange for cash within the next 12 months, is $348 million. And you compare that to their current liabilities at 73 million, that is something that you wanna see in a company. You want any company that you're investing in to have enough current and total assets to cover their current and total liabilities a few times over to know that the company is sustainable to run on its own and won't run into any debt issues anytime soon. Number four is Cresco Labs, and they trade on the over-the-counter markets with the ticker symbol CRLBF and on the Canadian Securities Exchange under the ticker CL.CN. Cresco's user experience starts out with a smooth, colorful texture sample showcasing their brands as they are on a mission to normalize, professionalize, and revolutionize cannabis. So far, they're doing a bloody good job at it while educating patients about their new medicinal alternative while they're at it. They have over 29 licenses and 19 owned dispensaries in six states so far, Arizona, Illinois, Massachusetts, New York, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, but they hope to have nine soon pending acquisitions and regulatory approval. Highlights from their second quarter were $94.3 million in revenue, up 42% from Q1. They also highlighted an increase in revenue by more than 30% in every single U.S. market except for Massachusetts, which, account, which accounts for a lot of cannabis buying with those stimulus checks. All in all, they suffered a net loss of $4.7 million, which means they did not turn a profit this quarter, but they did reduce cash used in operating activities from $40 million to $9 million, which was helped by increased operating leverage across the business as the company continues to scale. This means they are improving their systems so they aren't required to spend as much cash in order to make the same amount of money going forward. So with that said, the growth pretty much is guaranteed as long as expansion continues. However, Cresco is still yet to turn a profit from the previous year or quarter, always due to these income tax or other expenses, which probably stands from the legality of cannabis laws right now. And if we jump over to take a look at their balance sheet, they have total current assets of 225 million compared to their current liabilities of 163 million, which puts Cresco in a much better position now than they were last year and, has, and gives them some breathing room to keep expanding. 
Lastly, Harvest Health and Recreation Inc. trades on the over-the-counter markets with the ticker symbol HRVSF and on the Canadian Securities Exchange under the ticker HARV.CN. It is the smallest company of the bunch, but notice the chart. At one point, due to hype and optimism, Harvest had previously hit $12 a share. So as long as they keep growing and cutting costs as they expand, there's no reason to think that they might not get back to that point at some time in the future. It's often just a matter of when. So just as an example, if you were to pay attention to this company and scoop up shares for a dollar in the future, or even if you bought now at around $1.50 and just waited, once the price were to rebound in the future to $12, you would effectively 9x or 12x your money, and that is the power of investing. And for me personally, diving into the site, I don't know why, but the colors green, blue, and yellow just hit, so immediately their branding pulls me in. User experience is how the customer, like you and I, feels about an app or website that we're using. This is why companies invest a lot of time and effort in making their platforms easy to use, and their purchase process is seamless and convenient, making for a positive experience which increases the chances of earning your business again. Now, Harvest currently operates in six states across the U.S. as well, focusing on medical cannabis in Arizona, California, Florida, Maryland, North Dakota, and Pennsylvania. Their website makes it very easy to search for brick-and-mortar shops near you, which is, as an investor, another thing to consider. If a shop is in your area, you can go feel it, touch it, it's real, and as long as it's open and there is demand, it will make money. And another thing to note about Harvest is their focus on education around their products, like all the other companies as well, to be honest. Unlike big pharma companies who just want to get their patients addicted so they come back for more, cannabis companies want to empower their patients and educate them on the real benefits of using medicinal cannabis to help everyday people deal with chronic pain, PTSD, seizures, multiple sclerosis, HIV and AIDS, Crohn's disease, Alzheimer's, hepatitis C, cancer, glaucoma, ALS as well. Another thing I just have to point out is that you'll never see cannabis ads on TV since legally they're not allowed, which is strange because it's just a natural plant. But for some reason, it's okay to flood the airwaves with big pharma pills that have a list of side effects taller than me, which start happening when you start using them, when you stop using them, and when you change the amount that you're using? If you could promote medical cannabis like big pharma pills, side effects would include laughter, increased appetite, smiling, loss of ego, an improved sex drive, forgiveness leading to more openness and communication between family members closed off for decades, and best of all, some freaking mental clarity free of drowsiness, diarrhea, vomiting, and constipation. Obviously, effects vary from person to person, but you can't know until you've tried the alternative, or at least have it available in your state. So how is Harvest doing financially? Well, they have total assets of $834 million and total liabilities of $450 million, putting their shareholder equity or book value at $384 million, slightly below their current market cap. And although Harvest Health is seeing great year-over-year -year and quarter-over-quarter -quarter growth, they are not cash flow positive just yet. However, their loss per share each quarter is decreasing, so as an investor, you want to look for them to reach prof profitability within the next year. And one last point on profitability so you don't get the idea that these companies might crumble overnight. It's very common for young companies to see revenue growth but not turn a profit right away as they work to reduce costs. The thing is, this can't go on forever, making the goal to become profitable as soon as possible. So here are some other large companies you've likely heard of that despite being valued in billions, have yet to turn a profit. They include Snapchat, Willow, Square, Uber, Lyft, Pinterest, WeWork, Spotify, massive companies you've known for a long time, but still not profitable. So don't count any of these cannabis companies out when history looks like it might actually be in their favor for once. And that is it for this episode, everyone. Are you watching any of these companies or did I miss any that you like? Also, what states do you think will legalize next? Please let me know in the comments and tell me what you think might happen so we can have a discussion and try and help everyone make the best educated investments going forward. I want to thank all of you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it educational. If you did, I would really appreciate it if you can smash that like button for me and make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss any new episodes. If you are curious to learn more about the industry and how to invest in it for the long term, I'll see you next week for episode four on the top cannabis companies in Canada. Thank you so much again for tuning in, everybody. This is your host, Jordan Hiley, signing off. Stay highly invested in yourselves, everybody. Till next time.